<clears throat> the P stands for perseverance. Uh, is that supposed to be an E or an A? Perseverance of the saints. I may have misspelled perseverance there. Perseverance of the saints means all the way through the Bible, you're going to see things like those who persevere to the end. Those will be saved who hang on to the end, who persevere in the faith. Some will start in the faith and not continue in the faith and not persevere. The piece says, according to the Protestants, everyone who God chooses, whom he elects, whom the Son dies for, receives the Holy Spirit of grace, and they will therefore persevere because they've been sealed by the grace of God with the Holy Spirit of God. So you don't have to be afraid that you're going to lose your salvation. You don't have to be afraid that suddenly one day you're just going to apostatize so badly that there's no way God can get you back. You will persevere in the faith. I've said frequently there are folks who will say, you know, I could quit this if I wanted to. And I always challenge them and say, go ahead, do it. Knock yourself out. If you think you can quit God, go right ahead. Let's find out who's bigger, you or God. Go ahead. By the way, I can save you some trouble. But go ahead, try. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Now the L, right in the middle of all this, the L stands for limited atonement. So if you follow through these five points, what you get is human beings are totally sinful and depraved. Therefore, God chose some people for salvation, but he didn't do it based on any merit in the people. He did it on unconditional election. He sent his son to die for those particular people. The atonement is limited to those particular people. Those people receive the Holy Spirit of God. They are irresistibly saved. That is the irresistible grace of God. As a consequence, those same people will persevere to the end and receive eternal life. The five points fit together systematically with great perfection, and they are amazingly biblical. Now, I was fine with the T, the U, and the I, and the P the first time I heard it. First time I read about it, I said, yes, I, I get it. I'm not quite tulip, but I'm definitely tulip. <laughs> I'm, I'm there. But I even had my proof text together in order to argue for universal atonement. That when Jesus died, he died for everybody equally. I would go right to, hey, he bought the whole field so he could get the treasure out of the field. I even had my proof text ready. I was ready to argue with anybody. One day I was given some cassettes from the conference that now is in Lexington every August, except that in those days it was taking place out in uh, Oak, Ridge. Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And so I was given some cassettes from the conference. And it was the first time that I ever heard my friend David Morris preaching. And uh, the cassette was terrible. The audio was so bad that I had to sit in my car, turn the right speaker all the way up to 10 and turn the left speaker off, and then sit and concentrate to listen. But there was this man talking, teaching each of these five points. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going right to limited atonement. I'll show you. And by the time he got done, I came away saying, it can't be any other way. There's no way around it, friends. Either Jesus died for the sins of all humanity and saved nobody, or he died for particular people and fully, completely, utterly saved those people. Now get this right, everybody limits the atonement. Either you have to say the atonement was for everybody, but not effective for anybody. So you've limited its efficiency. You've limited what it can do. It was for everyone but it's limited in its power to save. It only makes salvation available, but didn't save anybody. Or you limit its scope. And you say it wasn't for everybody, but it did exactly what it was meant to do. Either way, it's a limitation. The picture that I've often used to explain this to people is that the, the Arminian view of the atonement 
is that Jesus died on the cross to build a bridge between man and God. But Jesus could only build the bridge halfway to God. Now, it's a big, broad, wide bridge. And anybody who wants to can get on that bridge. But halfway across it, you better bring some concrete and some girders, because you're going to have to work to finish that bridge. Oh, it's a big, wide, welcome bridge. Come on. But it only gets you halfway there. Or the Calvinistic view is, it's a very good, sturdy bridge. It goes all the way across, but it's very narrow. And not everybody gets to go on that bridge. But if you're on the bridge, you're going to get all the way to the other side, because it's a good bridge. He built it completely. Now, I got that imagery from Jesus saying, straight is the gate, narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. Do you remember the next line? And few there be that find it. And by comparison, he says, but broad is the way, and wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Lots of people get on that broad road to destruction. But the road to salvation is narrow, it's specific, and it's limited. Well, once I started exploring the topic of limited atonement, I ended up in John 10. And I ended up in Jesus saying these words, red letter words, out of Jesus' own mouth that have nothing to do with Calvinism. Jesus was not a Calvinist. Calvinism is Christianity. You understand me? Yes. Jesus didn't say these words so that the Reformers could upset people. The Reformers agreed with these words and it upset people. <laughs> you understand me? Yes. 